All right, well, we're once, once again back in Colossians chapter number 3. The last verse that we looked at uh, in our last lesson was verse number 13. And, uh, of course, Paul has been laying the groundwork as far as our, our old lives, the old man, the, the, the unfortunate things that characterized us as uh, mere men, right? Uh, lost people. And now that we're saved and born again, he was telling us, of course, uh, take those things off. Take those, it's like take those clothes off, those, those old tattered clothes, those clothes of, of, of bitterness and anger and wrath and malice and strife and slander and all of these things. Put those things off. And then he, of course, is going to start talking about what to put on, right? Uh, and so he starts off with verse 14, he says, Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Messiah rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. So again, up until now he's been telling us what to put off. Well now, here are some things that we need to be putting on. And of course, the first, the first of these is love love and it's that's the belt that's the belt that ties everything together love is what sent Yeshua to the cross so he says beyond all these things put on love which is the perfect bond of unity that's love love is the glue which keeps any relationship together love whether it's a, a, a marriage a family a congregation, any relationship, it's love that's going to be the glue which holds it together. Uh, Wearsby in his commentary says, When love rules in our lives, it unites these spiritual virtues so that there is beauty and harmony, indicating spiritual maturity. This harmony and maturity keep the life balanced and growing. The Gnostic system could never do this. So beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, let the peace of Messiah rule in your hearts. Erene is the Greek word for peace. Uh, we would think, of course, when we think of peace, obviously, in Hebrew it's shalom, right? Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you, who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So when, when we have truly, and, and of course we have peace with God, right? I mean, there's, we're, we're, we're no longer at enmity with him. There's no more condemnation. Truly we have peace from a spiritual standpoint. But then again, how many of us, aside from that, have peace? Because when we have peace truly within ourselves, there'll be peace amongst us. When there's, when there's aggravation and strife in any relationship, of course, love is wanting, but where's the peace? When peace exists within us, peace will exist among us. Uh, <laughs> here's a good example. Look at Jonah. Uh, Jonah had a rebellious nature. There was no peace within Jonah. And he decided he was going to flee. Flee from the calling which God had placed on his life. And what happened? The storm that was inside of him became the storm outside. And everybody around him, when he got on that ship, everybody experienced the storm. The very storm that was going on inside, now everybody was drawn into that storm. 
And that's oftentimes what happens when we don't have peace, is we're going to drag everybody else into the storm with us. So he says, to which indeed you were called, this peace, this peace within us, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. In a word, in, in a word, that's what you call election. You are called. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Messiah Yeshua. And have you ever noticed when, you know what I mean, when, when, when truly there's peace, when you're at peace um, with your Father, when, when you're... When, you're at peace with those around you. When there's peace inside, it seems, at least to me, it seems like I sing more. Um, I, I'm willing to put on my headphones and listen to music more, and I'm singing more, and I'm and I'm following along with the music more. And, and when there, when I'm not at peace, I, you know, I don't want to hear the music. I, I'd rather sulk. I'd rather be upset. But when I'm when I'm at peace. It, I, I find that, or I, I find myself singing much more often. So he's going somewhere with this. Verse 16, let the word of Messiah richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The word of Messiah. So, Previously, he was talking about having the peace, right? The peace of Messiah. Now we're talking about the Word. And that shows you um, another biblical truth. You must become a child of God. So there, there's no more enmity, no more condemnation. We have peace with God. You must become a child of God first if there's ever going to be any enjoyment in the scriptures. Now there's a lot of people, unbelievers, who will pick up a Bible and read it and study it. And they don't have peace. There isn't true peace. They may have convinced themselves they have peace, but they don't have peace. But in order to enjoy, truly enjoy the scriptures, you have to have peace. There's no possible way Someone can enjoy the word of God unless they have the peace with God. Because it's his word. So he says this, this peace, right, this, this word must richly dwell within you. Dwell within you. When you think of the word dwelling, right, it, it's almost like a, a peaceful dwelling like you're at home. Right? I would hope all of our homes are peaceful dwellings. When you hear the preaching, whether it's on, Shab on Shabbat, um, whether it's a recorded message from your, you know, your favorite teacher, your favorite pastor, whatever it may be on TV or in an app, when you hear the preaching, do you feel at home? May that word richly dwell within you. When we get when we get together on Shabbat, does it feel like a family reunion? Many people don't feel that way. A number of believers, they, they go through the motions of religion, whether it's waking up on a Shabbat morning or whether it's waking up on a Sunday morning. And they'll go in and punch the time clock. And then when the 90 minutes are over, the 120 minutes are over, then it's, it's, it's heading on home. Did it feel like a family reunion? And if it didn't feel like a family reunion, well, whose fault is that? Within you. Another possible translation here is among you all, because that all, that you is, of course, plural here for Paul. So we're talking about church fellowship. Within you, within you all, or among you all. With all wisdom, he says. Wisdom, of course, is the Greek word Sophia. Sophia, with all wisdom. And you wonder, uh, how many churches, how many congregations... Are they emphasizing the Word of God and the wisdom that comes from the Word of God, or are they em emphasizing entertainment? And if they're en emphasizing entertainment, then what happens when the entertainment wears off? What happens when that when that emotional uh, roller coaster ride comes to an end? And you got to get off the roller coaster. Then what? 
teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Wiersbe writes, he says, There is, according to Paul, a definite relationship between our knowledge of the Bible and our expression of worship in song. One way we teach and encourage ourselves and others is through the singing of the Word of God. But if we do not know the Bible and understand it, we cannot honestly sing it from our hearts. He says, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It's a thought-provoking question. <laughs> really, how many songs, any more, in, in, this, in this generation? It's a scary question, actually. How many songs do you hear on Christian radio being sung by people who are not saved? It's a thought-provoking question. They don't even know God, and they're singing about Him. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, to God even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Messiah. So whether, whether you're singing from a, a, a printout or whether you're singing from a PowerPoint or a hymnal book, are you singing the words that you're seeing from your heart? Or are they just words on a page or a screen? And that's where preparation comes in. Preparation for the Sabbath day. Preparation for worship. Where all of a sudden the words on the screen or on the page, they're not just words on a page. Or, That's my heart. And I'm pouring it out to him. And I'm edifying those around me. Verse 17, now watch. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks through him to God the Father. The name. The name. We don't give much thought to names in our culture, but in the ancient Near East it was of utmost importance. We must act consistently with who our Savior is and what our Savior wants. Whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you do must be a representation of who your Master is. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory. Whether you're eating, whether you're drinking, washing the dishes, doing laundry, cutting the grass, going to work, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, you are representing Him. Everywhere you go and everything you do and everything you say, you're representing His name. Do all in the name of the Lord Yeshua. Who He is. What He has accomplished. The promises that he has made. The promises that he has made that he is going to keep. He's a God of covenant. And everything that we say and everything that we do is a representation of our God who is a God of covenant. His promises, his covenants which he has made, he is true to his word. And we must recognize that at all times. We are representing a king. We're representing a king. The name. Not only do we identify with Yeshua, we belong to Him. Many people call Him Savior, but how many truly, truly call Him Lord and mean it? Because when He's Lord, that means He gets to tell you what to do. Exodus 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. So many people think that has something to do with like taking the name, whether it's God or Jesus or Yeshua or what have you, and cursing with it. <laughs> now certainly that, that plays into it. But when we do anything, when we say anything, which does not properly represent who he is, we are taking his name in vain. We're desecrating his name. We're not representing him to our spouses, to our family, to our bosses, to our fellow employees. 
the world, we are not representing truly who he is. Wiersbe says, we must do and say everything on the authority of his name and for the honor of his name. Paul says, giving thanks through him to God the Father, Yeshua, our high priest, our intercessor, our advocate. You know, before we get into the, the final two verses uh, for tonight, America, of course, has a very serious problem. Recent statistics are incredibly troubling when it comes to families. Over currently now, over 70% of black children that are born are born to one parent. And when you go into the inner cities, New York, L.A., Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit, what have you, that number jumps to over 90%. 90% of all black children that are born are born to just one parent. That's a travesty. Between 2 and 4 million children are physically abused, some sexually and then you have to wonder, of two to four million, how, how many are, aren't even reported? They're not even reported. American marriages are under attack. Families are falling apart. Kids are being raised by TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Of all people, I thought I would never thought I ran across a quote, and I thought I never thought I, I would actually quote from Confucius. But Confucius says, "The strength of a nation is derived from the integrity of its homes." So, if Paul is saying, if the word of God richly dwells in you, it will be manifested in your life. And a spirit-filled life will have a positive in fact, in effect in your marriage and in your home. That's where he's going. Everything that he has laid down thus far now takes us into verse 18. So all that he has talked about, about a spirit-filled life and, and having peace and being thankful and singing songs and, and your heart is right with God and there's a peace inside and, and all of this, watch... Wives be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. It's unfortunate that I've heard so many teachings where that's the first verse that's, that's, that starts off the teaching. And it's almost as if all those other verses before then aren't even addressed. If you have the peace and if you have contentment and all of these things and joy in your heart, well then verse 18, wives be subject to your husband, it's not that difficult. Now, we have no idea why Paul starts off with the lady of the home, but nevertheless, he addresses wives first, and he says, Be subject to your husbands. Hupadaso is that word, subject. And it means to willingly put oneself under someone. To willingly put oneself under someone. He uses the same word, Romans 8, 7. Paul says, Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself. There's the word. Subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. The flesh does not want to submit or place itself under the authority of God. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. In the military... You have privates and you have colonels. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It means they have different ranks. The colonel is not better than the private and the private's not better than the colonel. But they don't have the same rank. One has a higher rank and along with the rank has a higher responsibility. And the private has to understand that. Wiersbe writes, he says, God does all things decently and in order. If he did not have a chain of command in society, we would have chaos. The fact that the woman is to submit to her husband does not suggest that the man is better than the woman. It only means that the man has the responsibility of headship and leadership in the home. So what was one of the 
the th- again, we, we lose a lot of things when we go from Koine Greek to English, unfortunately. So the word subject has to be explained a little bit. Paul is writing this in what is called the middle voice, which obviously English doesn't have. But the middle voice implies a voluntary subjection or a voluntary submission. So wives voluntarily subject to yourselves to your husbands, in other words. When you go back to the garden where everything fell apart, Eve made a decision in the garden. And she made a decision that wasn't hers to make. And that's why Lucifer went to her. Lucifer went to her. He didn't go to Adam. Wonder why. Eve should have said, (laughs) when Satan went ahead and said, hey, you know, did God really say that? Because the day you eat of it, hey, you're going to be like him. At that, even before it got to that point, what Eve should have said was, hold on a minute, let me get my husband. But she carries on the conversation And she made a decision that didn't belong to her. It wasn't hers to make. Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, God saying, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Now watch, what did that, what her, she took on a, she really took on a position and a role that did not belong to her. She made a decision that wasn't hers. So he says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. People erroneously look at that verse and think that there's some kind of physical attraction there. Some kind of of sexual attraction. Some kind of, of physical desire. That has nothing to do with it. In other words, what God is saying is this. You have this desire, which has already been demonstrated quite clearly. You have this this desire to take control, to rule over your husband. I am going to greatly increase that desire. Since you want to rule over him, the curse is going to be that that desire is going to be greatly increased. And since that day in the garden, women have been wanting to rule over men. That is part of the curse. And any woman that says otherwise, you're lying. (laughs) Because it's part of the curse. Now, I'll get to men before long, but that desire to rule and not submit was handed down to each and every woman from your mother Eve. So when you see her, you can thank her. Um, Tony Evans has done a pretty good teaching on this passage uh, as well. And he he brings up an excellent point, and so I'll reiterate it for you. Uh, It's a challenge. And he, he says, ladies, when you go to work, you go to work, you have a, whether you call him a manager or a boss or a supervisor or what have you. And let's, let's say it's a man. He said, you have the ability to say, good morning, Mr. Smith, or good afternoon, Mr. Jones, or you have the ability to be respectful to your boss. You understand the the position your boss has or your supervisor has. You understand the position and you're respectful of that position. And Tony Evans asked the question, why can't you do it in the home? If you can do it in the workplace, why can't you do it in the home? The boss, the position of a supervisor or manager was handed to him by someone else. The position of husband And that leadership position was also handed to your husband. He didn't assume it on his own. And Tony Evans says the reason why most women will gladly go ahead and submit to the authority of a boss 
or a manager, but not submit to the authority of their husband, is because at the end of the week or every two weeks, there's a check. And you know, if you don't submit to that authority, if you talk back to that authority, not only will you not get a check, you're probably going to be looking for a new job. And it's true. Wiersbe writes, true spiritual submission is the secret of growth and fulfillment. When a Christian woman is submitted to the Lord and to her husband, she experiences a release and fulfillment that she can have no other way. This mutual love and submission creates an atmosphere of growth in the home that enables both the husband and the wife to become all that God wants them to be. So here, here is how the culture, first off, the devil, but here's how the culture, and especially here in America, this is how the culture and society has tricked all of you ladies. If you submit to your husbands, you're weak. You're weak. And that's the complete opposite of how God sees it. The complete opposite. In fact, according to Paul, which is reiterating God's word, if you submit to the position and the responsibility that your husband has, that's not a sign of weakness, that's a sign of strength. It's a sign of strength because your flesh is telling you to do otherwise. And you're not giving into the flesh. And you're not giving into society. The culture will tell you you're weak. Your flesh will tell you you're weak. God's word says the opposite. That's actually a sign of strength. But look, he says, so wives, subject, you know, be subject, right? Be subject to your husbands. And then, but watch this phrase, as is fitting in the Lord. Meaning, your husband has that headship, that, that authority, that responsibility, but there are limitations to it. There's limitations to your submission to him. Paul is not commanding blind obedience. Nor is he suggesting masculine dominance. The husband cannot ask his wife to do something that the, that the Lord God in his word said not to do. He cannot tell you to do something God says not to do. And he can't tell you to not do something that God specifically tells you to do. No husband has the right to tell his wife, no, you're not going to Shabbat service today. Because the word of God clearly says that you have that. And in fact, you should. J. Vernon McGee writes, A woman wrote to me and said that her husband was an unsaved man. When he would get drunk, he would beat her. She felt as a Christian she ought to stay with him. I advise her to leave him. I do not believe that God ever asks any woman to stay with a drunken husband. She loses her own personality, she loses her own dignity, and she will find herself being brought down to his level if she submits to that. She is to submit as it is fitting in the Lord. As it is fitting in the Lord. If your husband is telling you to do something that doesn't co coincide with Scripture, he has no right to say that. So there is what is considered culturally appropriate or fitting. The culture may tell you one thing, but what is fitting in the Lord? That's where Paul's going. Yeshua, think of it this way. Yeshua would never abuse you. Yeshua would never talk down to you. Yeshua would never call you a name. Yeshua would never lay his hand on you. If that's the case, no husband should do likewise. I've said many times, God did not make you a doormat. So don't let any man go ahead and walk all over you. He didn't make you into he didn't make you into a punching bag. Don't let any man treat you like one. Be subject to the authority. Now men, husbands, husbands love your wives and do not be bitter embittered against them. So you know, tongue in cheek, if you haven't noticed, wives cannot have other wives. Husbands cannot have other husbands. As if I had to remind anybody. Husbands, the responsibility has been given to you as the leader. You didn't assume it, God gave it to you. That being the case, 
when everything fell apart in that garden, who did God come looking for? He didn't say, Adam and Eve, where are you? Adam, where are you? Why? Why, Adam? Because I left you in charge. Yeah, but no, there's no buts. <laughs> there's no but. I left you in charge. What happened? When, it, when a company is failing, the CEO is not going to walk into the building looking for the janitor or the secretary or accounts receivable. Where's the boss? Where's the manager? I need to speak with him. That's how it goes. You have the responsibility. With that responsibility comes a lot of responsibility. Love your wives. Agapao. It's a sacrificial love. Eris, that erotic kind of love, Eris love, That's you can find that in the Song of Solomon. That's not what Paul is talking about here. It's a sacrificial love. What kind of love? Ephesians 5.25 and following. Husbands, love your wives, just as Messiah also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Messiah also does the church. So love isn't about just, I'm going to give you gifts and kind words. It's a sacrificial love. It's a concern for not only her health and her welfare, but her happiness. Is she growing in the Lord? Is she maturing in the Lord? If not, then why not? That responsibility falls on you as well. Do not be embittered against them. Great question. Why would a husband be bitter? Why would a husband be bitter? It goes back to the curse. It goes back to control. What did God say? You want control, Eve. Eve, you want to control your husband. And so you want that authority. You want to take it from him. Your, your desire is to control it. And I'm going to increase that. Well, guess what? Paul is saying, men, husbands, you better understand that. That's part of the curse. Don't be embittered against them. You and I, we have to understand when she behaves like that, not if... When she behaves like that, you must understand her fleshly desires. The flesh tells her, do not submit. God's word said yes. So when a husband's wife attempts to control, we have the ability, because of how we're built, the result is just using brute strength. And more often than not, it's through our voices. More often than not, it's through our voices. It should ne it's certainly better ne never be through, through physical contact. But usually it's through the voice. I'm going to get my way. I'm going to get my way in this argument or whatnot through my voice. And he says, don't be embittered. Pick rhino. Uh, the Greek there is in the passive voice. Is in the passive, which simply means do not be resentful. Do not be resentful. Garland, in his commentary, says, Christians must refrain from becoming flush with rage or petulant when others treat them or respond to them in ways that irritate them. This directive addresses the eventuality that the wife might not always be properly submissive, which in turn would likely trigger bitterness in her husband. So Paul already knows what's going to happen. She's going to try and control you. So when she does, don't be, don't be resentful towards her. A husband's patience must match Yeshua's patience with us when we are not submissive. When, we don't, when we're not submissive to him and his word and his spirit, when we're not submissive, does he lose his patience? No, he's very patient with us. He's very patient with me. So if he's patient with me, I need to be patient with her. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 and 5, love is patient. Love is patient. What's the, what was Paul mentioning earlier? Put on love. 
Put on love. Love is patient. Love is kind, is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. That's love. That's patience and that's love. And love is patient. McGee writes, the husband who loves his wife is the one to whom the wife is to submit. She is not to be the one to take the lead in the family, but she is to urge him to take the lead. I think we have had this thing all wrong for a long time. In my entire ministry, I have removed the word obey from the marriage ceremony. I don't think it belongs in there at all. End quote. He's right. It's not about obedience. It's about submission to an authority that's over you. As the men understand there's an authority and a, and, and a submission that needs to be exhibited as well. So wives are to submit to their husband's authority, yes, and all of us need to submit to the Lord God. Finally, last words. Uh, I remember Tim, my teacher, Tim Hegg. He taught it this way. He said, God knows exactly how we are wired as men and women, as husbands and wives. And he also knows the sin nature that exists in men and women. And Tim explained it like this. He said, fellas, husbands, if you truly, truly love your wives the way the Bible tells you to, she will submit to you. The flip side of that is, ladies, wives, if you truly submit to your husbands the way the Word of God tells you to, he will love you. And God understands that. And that's how we're wired if I do what I'm supposed to do, my wife will do what she's supposed to do. If my wife does what she's supposed to do, I will do what I'm supposed to do. And there's peace. But there's, has to, there has to be peace within us first. There can't be peace in a relationship. There cannot be peace in a home when there's no peace inside. So we'll move on to verse number 20 and children and then, of course, uh, servants and things like that in our, in our next lesson.